uh, generally when it comes to the gray wolf and the, ha the history that they've had with humans, uh, throughout the, uh, from the 1600s, the mid 1600s to the 1900s, they actually had a bounty placed onto their heads. Uh, the gray wolf and uh, the lower 48 states actually used to spread throughout basically the entirety of it, uh, but by the time the bounty was removed in the mid 1900s, those particular gray wolves actually were pushed almost entirely out of the lower 48 states. The only uh, gray wolves that were still here in the United States, uh, the lower 48, uh, were actually a small population of the gray wolves in the northeastern corner of Minnesota, where we actually are at right now. Uh, some wolves on Isle Royale, and then of course the red wolves, which are a different uh, species of, uh, than the gray wolves themselves. Uh, when, uh, in about 1973 is when the Endangered Species Act came into play, and that's roughly when the uh, wolves, uh, the gray wolves themselves, were also put onto the Endangered Species Act as well, and started to receive that protection. Uh, here in the Midwest, the wolves actually were able to recover quite naturally. Uh, there was no translocations or anything like that that had to be done. So they were actually able to spread from this northeastern tip down through uh, the rest of Minnesota, then to Michigan and Wisconsin. Uh, what, when it came to the West, however, it was a little bit of a different story. Well, they did and when you say West, what do you mean what, what, what West are you talking about? Like the uh, Western states like Idaho, Montana, Wyoming, uh, okay. even Oregon, Washington at this point. Uh, they did start to slowly uh, push into those regions by themselves, but they also were aided by range reduction. Uh, so in about 1990, I believe it was 1995 and 1996, uh, they actually introduced wolves into Yellowstone. And that was sort of the first major event where they had a lot of wolves actually be, uh, get, getting put into that particular region. Uh, in Yellowstone, of course, they do have federal protection regardless of whether they're in, uh, on the Endangered Species Act or not, just by, because they're in that national park. But um, nowadays, uh, they are declassified in, the, in, in those western states that I mentioned. Uh, and uh, while they're in Yellowstone, they do still Declassified, uh, sounded threatened, right? Or, or off? Yeah, so uh, out in the west, they're completely declassified from the endangered species. Okay. They're not threatened, they're not endangered, they are, for all intents and purposes, recovered. Okay. Uh, here in the Midwest, it's a little bit of a different story. Uh, when it comes to here, here in Minnesota, uh, we, we actually are doing quite well in terms of our wolf numbers uh, at about 2,655 or so. Uh, to put that into perspective, the entirety of the Western states only has about 1,700 wolves. Uh, when it comes to uh, Wisconsin, they also have about 940, and Michigan has about 662 or so. Uh, when it comes down to it, the wolf populations in this particular area are actually quite healthy. But uh, when it comes down to it, there are uh, people who are advocating for the wolves, trying to go ahead and encourage them to uh, keep the endangered, the, uh, the wolf, or uh, the gray wolf on the Endangered Species Act, uh, to just keep uh, sort of continuing that protection that they've had. Um, quite often, they'll use the argument that if they were to take the uh, wolves off that, the Endangered Species Act, they would most likely have so much uh, backlash from the people that don't necessarily like wolves that the population would be decimated. Uh, so that's sort of their stance on it. Uh, there's also the, uh, the researchers on the other end of the spectrum where the, who are basically saying that the wolves have recovered to the point that they, de that they don't need the protection. Uh, when it comes down to it, the purpose of the Endangered Species Act is to provide protection for animals that are on the brink of going extinct. Uh, so for wolves who are of least concern on even global scale, uh, gray wolves specifically, red wolves are a different story. Uh, when it comes to the gray wolves, they are actually doing quite well. Uh, it's also a little bit arbitrary that we have defined the Endangered Species Act the way we have. It's a little bit of a challenging subject because even when we had no wolves left here, well, virtually no wolves left, uh, they, were, uh, they were still very common throughout the rest of the world. Uh, so basically we're just looking internally in the United States for the Endangered Species Act more than anything else. Uh, but yeah, so uh, when it comes down to it, aside from the researchers saying that they have recovered quite effectively, there's also the, the livestock owners and the hunters who also want more management options Right. for the wolf populations themselves. Uh, so when it comes down to it, the entire goal that we have at our facility is to just make sure that we educate the public to the best of our abilities. That way they're able to make an educated decision for themselves, whether if they decide to support wolves, whether they decide that they don't want to support wolves. It's kind of just up to them. We just want it to be an educated de decision when it comes down to it. And you guys are saying that there's only a handful of depredation permits right now in the state issued a year? Yeah, so uh, when it comes down to it, I'm admittedly not very familiar with how, uh, the deprivation permits in general. Um, when it comes down to it, uh, there's just not very many instances where it happens. There's only maybe two or three uh, uh, particular uh, groups or individuals that are affected on a yearly mm -hmm. basis. Uh, when it comes down to it, there is, just, uh, there is an abundant amount of the natural prey available, and when there is that abundant prey, they don't generally go after the various livestock that those owners may have. Um, so when it comes to that of the Indian wolf, however, uh, 
just uh, they are a little bit of a different story. They have a lot less uh, uh, natural prey available to them. As a result of that, uh, they do quite often have to go out with livestock on a much more regular basis. Uh, so that does increase the sort of contentions that uh, the livestock owners in that particular region of the world have with the, the, the great wolves that are there. Uh, the Indian wolf, of course, being a subspecies of the great wolf. Um, so things are a little bit more intense there. Here in Minnesota, they're not so bad just because there is that prey available. And do you guys do, um, do you get, does the Wolf, International Wolf Center here, do, do you guys do collaring and tracking yourselves or are you guys doing primarily the education stuff? Yeah, so we're entirely education based. We don't have any research going on ourselves. Uh, that said, we do have some ties with the DNR, the Forest Service, basically the ones who are actively doing that sort of research. Cool. Um, a lot of the people who are on our uh, board, uh, basically our board, uh, are going ahead and uh, there were people that have had a significant hand in either the uh, development of the center itself or uh, just wolf research in general. Cool. So uh, we have sort of a mix of that uh, type of uh, individual there. So then tell me a little bit about this cool center. When did, you, when did this wolf center in Ely uh, first open up? Yeah, so uh, we've been here ever since about 1985 or so. Uh, that's more or less when the Wolf, Wolf Center first really got started. Um, it looks nothing like this at first. <laughs> it was basically just... This beautiful a, space you guys have. This is awesome. Yes, uh, it certainly has aged well. This, this facility was actually built in about 1993. Um, out, out here, there's sort of a little corner of the building that it looks a little bit odd compared to the rest of it. Uh, that actually was a, a building that existed long before this portion of it did. Hmm. Uh, this actually used to be a uh, shared space between the Wolf Center and the Forest Service for a, t a period of time. Hmm. Uh, basically, it was just that portion of the building over there, uh, a fence around uh, to uh, have the wolves being closed by, and a small, basically, shack for the uh, head of wolf care staff to actually go ahead and cool. make sure that the wolves were being uh, taken care of and safe on a regular basis. Um, so, uh, to say the least, uh, we have, uh, we've been around for, let's see, third, let's see, one, <laughs> about 39, almost 40 years at this point, which uh, well, uh, that was not necessarily correct. No, but but, but good since the 80s. So, yes. and how many people come through in a typical year right now? How many visitors do you guys get a year? -ish? So it does vary a little bit. Uh, so uh, when it comes down to it, we do get quite a few visitors. Uh, the majority of them, of course, is during the summer. On um, so, uh, busy summer months, quite often we'll have between uh, nine and twelve thousand people come in on, on a fairly regular basis. Uh, 12,000 is definitely more towards the high end of the spectrum. 9,000 is a lot more regular. Uh, on years that we have pups, which is actually going to be this coming year, uh, where uh, we generally have a lot more people coming in, mm -hmm. uh, which is uh, fairly understandable. It's quite exciting to have the wolf pups be introduced into the enclosure. Uh, but generally, that's what we usually expect to see. And you guys have four adults uh, in various enclosures that people can come see in these really cool viewing windows so they don't have to get in contact with the critters, but they can see them really close. Yeah, so we've got today an enclosure where all four of our wolves, well, four out of our five wolves live. Uh, what comes to this main, main enclosure, this is where Axel, Grayson, uh, uh, Denali, and Bolts live. These two wolves that, that are over here on this pile of hay that's over off to the right, uh, those wolves are Axel and Grayson. Uh, they're the Arctic subspecies of the gray wolf, which is found in the northernmost parts of Canada as well as Greenland. Uh, the two wolves that are not currently out visible right now are Denali and Bolts. Uh, when it comes to bulls, uh, he is the Great Plains subspecies, which is one that you find here in Minnesota, Michigan, and Wisconsin, and he is currently about seven years old. Uh, when it comes to Denali, uh, he is actually the Northwestern subspecies, which is what you find anywhere from Yellowstone all the way up to Alaska. Uh, he is currently 11 years old, so he's actually the oldest wolf that we've ever had inside of the main enclosure. Uh, the last wolf that is not actually in here is actually uh, Grizzer. He currently lives in retirement. Uh, retirement is a separate enclosure that's kind of off behind the buildings over to the left. Uh, ultimately, uh, those buildings are the wolf care buildings where we essentially prepare everything for our wolves, ranging from their food, medication, vitamins, supplements, anything that you could think of. Uh, just behind those buildings is where the retirement buildings are, and that is where Grizzer will live for the remainder of his life. Uh, Grizzer is currently 15 and a half years old, making him the oldest wolf that we actually have here at our center as of right now. Cool. And, and uh, would you say that uh, most of the folks that are coming to visit are local or most of the folks are from far away that come to visit uh, the center usually here? Usually when, uh, when it comes down to it, a lot of it is uh, people coming from a further distance away. Uh -huh. uh, a lot of folks that are from around here do, uh, do go ahead and visit every so often, but it's also uh, a lot of folks that have already been here for a long time. They kind of know what we do, the, the, that's that sort of thing in general. Uh, so uh, the, the majority of the people that we get are definitely coming from far distances away. 
Cool. Um, cool. It's not all that uncommon fine. that we get people coming in from uh, other countries. Uh, we've had folks come in from Sweden recently, some, uh, some from Canada, of course. Canada, of course, being a much more common one, uh, to say the least. Uh, we're, we're weirdos from California, so there you go. <laughs> well, I was born in California, too. So, you know, uh, <laughs> it's not the most un un unlikely thing in the world. <laughs> but uh, yeah, uh, so we definitely have a lot of people coming around from a lot of different cultures. So, uh, so we definitely have all, a lot of uh, people coming in from all the different places. And you guys have cool programs online for people to read about, watch videos, yeah, so, online lectures, um, all kinds of cool stuff. Yeah, uh, so our website is basically wolf.org. It's nice and simple to remember, fortunately. Uh, we have all sorts of different resources there where people can go to uh, sort of learn about wolves, whether it's uh, wolf facts or learning about our wolves here at our center. Uh, we actually also have some wolf cams that we go ahead and broadcast on a daily basis. Uh, it's basically on this one section of the website where uh, you learn a little bit more about our wolves. Uh, we have one camera that's actually right here, so this sort of faces oh, yeah, the cool. main, main exhibit. Uh, so uh, on Saturday evenings we actually have our main feeding. So around 7, 27, 30, if you're interested in seeing that, that would definitely be a really good time to actually check that out. Uh, otherwise, we also have uh, in, uh, two cameras in retirement, which will give you an opportunity to see the reserve because unfortunately we don't have public viewing on site for that. Cool. Awesome. Well, thanks. That was great. That was a great summary. Them, Thank you. You just feed them yeah, once of a month, once a year, once a week? Yeah, so once a week is generally how often we'll feed them. Uh, the reason being is that wolves in the wild are on a decent fan and cycle diet, so usually about one, every one meal every one to two weeks. Uh, so uh, we want to try to reflect that with our wolves here. Uh, so typically they get their main meal on Saturday evenings, but we do also supplement with a smaller meal on Tuesdays and Thursdays, just to make sure that all the wolves did get enough food to make them, uh, to make them last until the next Saturday. Uh, and what's, uh, what's the meal? Uh, so uh, typically it's about the equivalent of one white wolf white tail deer. That's usually far less what they get. One, uh, one deer for the wolf? Uh, no, one deer for the uh, whole pack. Uh, generally speaking, a uh, uh, wolf can eat up to 20 pounds of food in a single sitting, and one white tail deer sort of fits the bill for about the average pack of four or five years. Are you guys wolf questing? I have no idea. <laughs> What's crazy to me is how this guy's head is just all bone. It is. Just a big helmet of bone. Honking dude. <laughs> <laughs>